Hello, it's time for hashing part two. Let's start out with a bit of review. When we're talking about hash tables, we have some keys of some type E that we're storing in our hash table. And the client, the code that's using the hash table is responsible for turning those objects into integers. And then the hash table library, the implementation of the hash map or hash set in Java, for example, will turn those integers into table indexes in some fixed size internal array. So like with our array list, we have this fixed size internal array that's holding our data, but we've introduced this idea of a hash function that is going to turn an object into a table index. Now, multiple keys, multiple different objects may end up hashing to the same table index, and so that's what we'll be talking about today. How do we resolve that situation? But to remind you, we're aiming for constant time map ADT operations, put, contains, remove, get as well, and this is going to be on average under some reasonable assumptions that we'll get to today. And this hash table has some array of fixed size, but it's extensible. Just like with the array list, if we run out of room or we need more space, we're going to allocate a larger internal array and copy the data over. So when we have these collisions, when we have two different keys end up at the same table uh, index, we call this a collision. And we're going to try and do what we can to avoid it, but the number of possible keys will typically greatly exceed the size of our table, so we can rarely make it impossible that two keys would end up mapping to the same location. And so hash tables have to support some way of resolving these collisions, of dealing with this situation in a way that, that lets the program proceed. But we, as I said, we are going to try and avoid these collisions as much as possible. And in addition to a good hash function, there is something kind of on the hash table library side that we can do. So when we're turning an int into a table index, as we saw in the last lesson, we uh, take that int and mod it by the table size. That gives us an, an index. And uh, the number of collisions that this is going to create, the number of times we're going to get keys uh, being uh, indexed to the same place in our array, it's going to depend on the keys that we're inserting, uh, but also the table size will have an effect on this. So a larger table size can help, but not always. So consider this example where we have a table size of 10 and these five, uh, these five keys. And uh, both 70 and 10 will hash to table index 0 when we have table size 10. 70 mod 10 is 0, 10 mod 10 is 0. And to try and resolve this situation, we make our table six times as big. This should help, right? But when we have a table size of 60, the key 10 hashes to index 10, the key 70 also hashes to index 10. So we've actually not reduced the collisions at all despite making the table bigger. But one good technique is to pick a table size that is prime. And the reason for this is that real life data tends to have a pattern to it. We're typically not dealing with data that's just distributed uh, uniformly at random over all possible keys. There's typically are going to be uh, various patterns. And for this reason, if we pick a prime table size, multiples of say 61, a prime number, are probably less likely than multiples of 60 in real world data. A little more on making the table size prime. Going back to if our table size is 60 and we have lots of keys hashed to multiples of 5, then we have 80% of the table that is not used by these multiples of 5. If it's multiples of 10, there's 90% uh, of the table indexes that are not uh, used by, by multiple of 10, multiples of 10. If we have multiples of 2, we still have half the table wasted where if we choose a prime number like 61, we don't make it impossible for collisions to happen, but these multiples that I was talking about, multiples of 5, multiples of 10, multiples of 2, they will actually fill up all 61 spots in the table. We won't have any indexes that just can't be used when we hash these uh, multiples of, of some number. And so, this table filling property, which is which is what we want, we 
would like it for the keys we are hashing to kind of all end up in different indexes and fill up the whole table. This is going to happen when the multiple, like whether it's multiples of five or 10 or two, uh, and the table size uh, have a greatest common divisor, greatest common factor of one. So it, since 61 is, is prime, its greatest common factor with uh, anything that's not a multiple of 61 Going to be going to be one and going to be more likely to have this table filling property that we want. But this prime table size is not foolproof. We can have collisions even with a prime table size, as I'll show in this example. So I have here a, a hash table with a table size of 11, nice prime number. And one strategy that we can use is that when elements end up at the same index, all those keys will be just kept in a linked list or a chain or a bucket uh, at that index. And this is uh, kind of as straightforward as it sounds. Uh, to show you the example, let's insert these five keys using just our mod table size hash function. And that means that our key 11, mod 11, goes to zero. Since there's no linked list there initially, when we insert our first key at index zero, we're just gonna create a linked list with that value at the head. Our key of 24 mod 11 is two, so we'll create uh, a new linked list there. Our key 106 is uh, seven mod 11, so we'll create a linked list there. Our key 13 is two mod 11. We go to two, there's already a linked list there, but that's no problem. We will just insert the new key at the head of the linked list, which we know is a constant time operation, so even Though there was a key there already, we can in constant time just insert our new key at the head of that linked list, 46 also to uh, mod 11, and we just insert that at the head of our linked list. And so this is kind of a, a, a just a nice simple solution to handle this situation where we might have multiple keys go to the same index. We just keep everything in a linked list. So let's reflect on this separate chaining strategy. So what is the worst case time for a contains operation, right? This map ADT operation that we're implementing via hash table. This is going to be linear because in the worst case, if we get really unlucky or say we have a bad hash function that just returns uh, the same integer for a lot of different keys, we could end up with all of our keys into the same index and we just have one long linked list there uh, and that's, that contains all of our keys. Well, we know that to run the contains operation on a linked list, that's linear. And in this uh, worst case, we can end up with uh, our hash table just really being a linked list with all the all the keys in, in one of these buckets. Um, but this is either really bad luck or a very bad hash function. So we don't really wanna do extra work to avoid this worst case because it's not really the hash table's fault. So we're not going to hold this against uh, separate chaining necessarily, but kind of beyond the asymptotic complexity of, in this worst case, this contains is, is linear, we might be able to uh, do some data structure engineering to kind of get uh, a bit more performance out of our uh, separate chaining hash table. Uh, we think about do we want a linked list it, at each index? Do we want an array there? Maybe we want a s sorted array so we can uh, do binary search if the keys are comparable. Maybe we want a chunked list uh, that is like a link list where each node has a like, like small array of elements. We do want to keep the list short because we do have to look through all the elements in a list at a particular index when we hash to that location. Uh, we could also think about uh, whenever we access an element, uh, we move it to the front of the linked list there so that it's faster to access in the future on the idea that uh, the same element may be likely to be accessed again. And maybe we could leave room for one or two elements in the table itself. Uh, and to show you what I mean for that, uh, in the example I showed, we just created a linked list uh, to hold all the data at any index. Uh, and we could kind of improve the constant factor aspect of our hash table performance by storing say the first element at a location directly there, and then the linked list only holds uh, additional elements. Uh, and so this is going to kind of reduce 
the constant factor of how much work we have to do to access any one, uh, which may matter a lot in, in practice, even though that wouldn't show up in our asymptotic analysis. So uh, let's analyze this a little more mathematically uh, and define something called the load factor, which, uh, for which I'll use the Greek symbol lambda, and say that the load factor of a hash table is the fraction of the slots in our array that are currently used. So if we have a table size of 10 and we have five elements in it, our load factor is 0 0.5. We're using half of the available slots in our hash table. Under chaining, if we're using this separate chaining strategy, uh, we might think about what is the average number of elements per, per bucket here, per array index. And an easy way to think about this is what if our load factor is 2? Right? What if we have two elements uh, for every spot in our table? Well, then if we average out all the different spots on our table, we're going to average to lambda. We're going to average to two elements per spot, even if in, they're actually distributed a little differently. On average, it will be uh, lambda elements per, per slot. Uh, so if we put a bunch of uh, things in our hash table and then, random, and then call contains with some random arguments that may or may not be in, our, be in our hash table. We can then say, on average, how many compares, how many things do we have to compare our uh, key to when we don't find it, when it's not in the table, when the contains is unsuccessful? Well, we hash the key, we go to that index, and then however many things are stored in our chain there, that's how many things we have to compare to. And as I just said, the average number of elements that are going to be stored at any one slot is lambda. So we're going to have to compare against lambda items uh, on every unsuccessful contains. Uh, for a successful contains, something that, it re that will return true, the key is in the hash table. We would then have to, on average, uh, compare to half of the elements in our uh, chain because on average, it's going to, or if we find it, it will be kind of halfway, halfway through. So we like to keep lambda fairly low for this reason, that uh, if we let lambda get really large, then uh, we're, our table's small and the number of things we're storing in it is, is very large. We're going to have these potentially long uh, linked lists uh, that we have to keep searching through. So we want to keep the, this load factor fairly low in order to get good performance uh, from this separate chaining. And these are the sort of assumptions that I was talking about uh, by which we're going to get that constant time performance. That we're going to assume that the load factor is kept uh, fairly low because if it's not, uh, we can no longer rely on uh, the sort of constant time performance. Uh, but separate chaining is not the only collision resolution strategy that we might use. Uh, if we go back to uh, this picture of separate chaining, uh, we have uh, five elements in this table, but there's a lot of empty space here, kind of free real estate that we're not using. Uh, maybe we should find some way to use it to store uh, these elements that are piling up uh, in these linked lists. Uh, and so that's what we'll consider next is if the index that we hash to is already full, then we're just going to try the next spot. We're going to add one to that index uh, and see if that's open. And if that's full, we're going to try the next slot after that and the next slot after that. And this is all mod table size, which is going to make us wrap back around to the beginning of our array uh, once we hit the end. So we can look at an example of how this works. Uh, we insert 38 in a table size of 10. 38 mod 10 puts it at, puts it at 8. 19 mod 10 puts that at 9, 8 mod 10 puts it at 8, that's full, so then we add 1 to our hash, uh, to the index that we got, and try that, that's 9, that's full, we add 1, that would be 10, mod 10 is 0, well that's open, so we'll just put 8 there, 109, that mod 10 would be 9, that's full, so we try the next spot, that's full, so we try the next spot, so 109 eventually gets put at index 1, then we insert 10, 10 mod 10 is 0, that's full, so we again try the next spots until we find an open one and insert our value there. So 
This strategy is called probing, uh, where when a spot is full, we just kind of try other spots in the table uh, to see until we find an open one. This is also called open addressing, which to me is a kind of more confusing name, but that is what, for example, the Bailey textbook uh, calls this strategy, open addressing. Uh, I will call it probing. And what we just did uh, is a specific kind called linear probing, that we're just, each time uh, we look for a next spot, we're adding one, we're kind of linearly, linearly searching our hash table for the next open spot. And this uh, open addressing strategy is gonna do uh, quite poorly with a high load factor. And you can kind of see this by, if our table it has a high load factor, that means it's mostly or completely full. And when it's mostly full, we might have to kind of go forward a whole bunch of spots in the table before we find an open one. So if this load factor gets high, uh, we're going to end up having long probing operations. So when this load factor gets high, uh, this linear probing uh, may take a long time. So this means we're going to want larger tables. And if our load factor gets too high, if we're doing too many uh, checks to find an open spot in the table, we're going to lose this constant time uh, performance because every single operation will include a whole bunch of uh, searching for an open spot in the table. So I've been talking just about inserting things in the table just so far, right? That when we put uh, an, a new key into the table, we try and find a position, uh, an open spot using the, the probe uh, strategy, such as linear probing. We're gonna ask what about contains, right? What about checking if a key is already present in the table? Well, since we put something in the table using this probing strategy, we have to kind of use that same approach when checking if a key is already there to kind of retrace the steps we did to insert a key such that we can get to the same spot and check if uh, the key we're looking for is actually there. And once we reach an empty position uh, using this, this probing, that tells us that, okay, there are no more keys that we should check. We have verified that this key is not, is not present. What about remove? Well, remove is a bit tricky because if we remove a value and leave an empty spot, this could, uh, mislead this contains function in that it thinks it's hit an empty spot and that the key isn't there when really it should, should have just kept going. And for this reason, remove has to use something called lazy deletion, that when something is removed, it's not actually removed. It's just marked that there isn't any data here, but you need to keep, you need to treat it for the purpose of contains as if there is data here that doesn't match what you're looking for so that you keep probing. Uh, this is contrast with our separate chaining where remove, we don't have to worry about uh, kind of preserving this probing behavior. We can just remove uh, an element from our linked list. So if these other operations seem a little confusing, uh, I'd like to do a visual example on the board. So we have our table here and I'll put the indexes on our slots. So table size of five, and uh, we are using this uh, linear probing collision resolution strategy. Uh, and so uh, let's put uh, two into the table. Uh, and so that's just going to end up here at two. Uh, then let's put uh, seven into the table, seven mod five also. Uh, would go to two, so we kind of probe to the next index, that's open, so we put seven there. Uh, then let's say we uh, put eight into the table, eight mod five would be three, that's full, so we probe to the next open spot and do that, and then let's say We remove seven, and so to remove seven, we uh, do seven mod five, that's two. We need to check, oh, is the key at this index the one we're looking for? No, uh, two is not seven, so maybe this was placed somewhere further down according to the probing, so we 
add one, check the next box. Oh, seven is what we're looking for. We remove it. But then if we say ask about contains eight, this is going to say uh, is eight in our table. Well, we know that it is. But when this operation runs, we do 8 mod 5, that's 3. We go to 3, we say, oh, that's empty. 8 must not be in our table. And this is why our remove needs to kind of mark this as, oh, there was data here. And so if you are searching for something with contains, you need to treat it as if there is data there that doesn't match what you're looking for so that you keep looking to the next place until you hit something that's truly empty. So what we need is some special value to say, all right, this spot was used, it's been removed, but you still have to treat it as if there is data there when we're doing contains, so that when we check 8 mod 3, 8 mod 5 is 3, we say this doesn't match 8, but it was used, so we should check the next place in order to find 8. And so that's why we have to do um, are uh, kind of lazy del deletion and also why contains needs to kind of replicate uh, this probing uh, strategy in order to correctly find values in the table. All right, there is, however, a particular problem with linear probing that arises called primary clustering. Uh, because even though this uh, probe function of just like adding one uh, to, to the index is very quick to compute, which uh, we want things to be fast, it's a bad idea because it tends to produce kind of clusters of values in our table, which lead to kind of long uh, probing sequences as we have to keep checking elements to find an open spot. And here's a kind of diagram of what this might look like, where we're inserting at different points in the table. And as our load factor increases, as we get more values, the kind of runs of values uh, in our table end up kind of clumping together and getting very long because we just keep inserting uh, new keys nearby keys that are already there. And this is a phenomenon called primary clustering. And in the small example I went through, we actually saw this starting to happen where kind of the 38 and 9 and 19 and these values were all kind of clumping up uh, in one part of our array. So we can analyze linear probing in a more rigorous way. And one observation is that as long as our load factor is less than one, as long as there exists an empty spot in our table, this linear probing will eventually find it. So it's kind of safe in that sense. It can't get into some sort of infinite loop where it can never find an empty spot unless the table is literally completely full. That said, its performance does get much, much worse as our load factor increases as the amount of kind of probes it needs to do to find an, an empty spot or to retrace these steps in order to do a contains operation. Uh, that just makes the performance of the hash table get much, much worse. We can see this in chart form where load factor is along the x-axis here. So load factor increases. Uh, and then the average number of probes uh, that have to be performed as part of any operation uh, is on the y-axis here. And so as we can see that as the load factor kind of approaches 80%, uh, our successful uh, linear probing goes from 1 to close to 4, and unsuccessful goes from 2 all the way up to 14 uh, for each operation. And this is only up to around 80%. If we take it all the way up to almost full, to 97%, uh, the performance just skyrockets, and we end up with uh, around 50 probes for a successful uh, search and over 300 for an unsuccessful. So using linear probing with a high load factor table uh, gets really awful performance. Uh, so this is in comparison to separate chaining, which kind of is taking up additional space, is right, we're having these linked lists and then empty wasted spots in the table. So uh, separate chaining isn't free, but it can deal with high load factors uh, much better because we're just searching these individual chains and not having to go through a whole bunch of spots in the table itself. But we can make our probing uh, strategy better. Instead of linear, we can make it quadratic. So this will avoid that this primary clustering problem. 
in general, we can say, all right, we get our hash of the key, and if that spot is full, we then add some function to it that is a function of the kind of ith step that we're on. So what I mean by this is if our function f is i squared, this quadratic probing, uh, then our sequence is, well, first we just check the hash of the key itself, my table size, then we add 1 squared, then we, if that's full, we add 2 squared, if that's full, we add 3 squared, and kind of at each step after that, we're on the ith probe, we're adding i squared to the index uh, that we're checking, and kind of the intuition for why this would improve this primary clustering problem is that instead of just kind of going one forward at a time, the way our linear probing does, our quadratic probing kind of searches farther and farther and farther away from the original uh, index. So it kind of quickly leaves the neighborhood of the original index we're looking at and might distribute values throughout the table in, in, a, kind of in, a, in a better way that avoids this primary clustering. So to do an example, uh, we have table size 10, we insert 89, 89 mod 10 is 9, stick it there, 18 mod 10, that's open, we put that at index 8, 49, that also hashes to index 9, that's full, so we search 1 squared spaces away, that's uh, mod table size, takes us around to the beginning, so we'll insert 49 and index 0, 58, that would go at index 8, that's full, we search 1 squared forward, that's full, so then we search two squared spaces forward, or four spaces forward for one, two, three, four. And so 58 will get inserted at index two. 79 goes through a similar process. Nine is full, we search one away. And since that's full, we search one, two, three, four away and insert it at index three. And so this will kind of space these out a little more, won't create these, these primary clusters. Uh, but as we'll see with this example, there's a kind of different vulnerability that arises. So here we have a table size 7. 76 is going to go to index 6. 40 mod 7 is 5, put that there. 48 mod 7 is 6, so we put it in the next spot after that, 1 squared spaces away. 5 mod 7 is 5, so 1 is full, so 1, 2, 3, 4, that goes in index 2. 55 is 6. Instead, one's full, so we go one, two, three, four, and then we get to 47, which should go at index five, but that's full. So we check one away, that's full. We check one, two, three, four away, that's full. So we check one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, that's full. So then we check four squared spaces away, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, that's full. And Oh no, no matter how many probes we do, this math will work out mod 7 to either be index 0, index 2, index 5, or index 6, and those are all full. So even though the table isn't full, this quadratic probing has hit a, uh, an infinite loop as it kind of has this cycle of it's always searching the same subset of the indexes and can never actually find uh, one of the two open spots using this quadratic probing. So we definitely need some way of dealing with this kind of problem that quadratic probing can have. And so the bad news, yeah, we can have quadratic pro probing cycle through the same indices and never finding an open spot even though one exists, but we can deal with this if we make the table size prime and we keep the load factor under half, then quadratic probing will take at most table size divided by two probes in order to find an empty slot. And so this means that if we maintain this property of a prime table size and a load factor and, and keep the table less than half full, we don't need to worry about, uh, about these cycles. And this gets to, well, how would we ensure that the load factor stays under half and that the table size is prime. And this gets to making our hash tables extensible like we did for our uh, uh, array list. And this is a process called rehashing because for our array list, when we double the size of our array, we just kind of copied over uh, the elements to exactly where they were. But for a hash table, 
the index that an element goes to depends on the table size. That if the table size changes, the key that the hash of the key mod the table size might be something different. So uh, we are going to still like our array based data structures kind of create a bigger internal array and copy things over. But instead of just copying them over to the same index, we're going to need to reapply the hash function to find uh, the correct index for each key in the new in the new table. And that's where this term rehashing comes from. Now, when would we want to do this? Uh, with chaining, with separate chaining, it's sort of up to us kind of what to full, like when it needs to get bigger, because as we talked about, separate chaining can handle high load factors fairly well. Uh, so maybe we want to, to keep the load factor less than one uh, to ensure, uh, to try and ensure that the, the chain stay fairly short. Um, and we, when kind of assessing whether it's time, we might consider the average size of our, of our chains or the maximum size. So if one gets too long, then we're like, all right, we need to make the table bigger to try and uh, keep the chain size small. There are different ways you could approach this. Uh, with probing, as we talked about, kind of keeping it under half full is a good rule of thumb, particularly if you're using quadratic programming. Sorry, particularly if you're using quadratic probing. And uh, what should the new table size be? Well, in our previous array-based data structures that we've looked at, we've always just doubled the table size. But if we double a prime table size, well, that won't be prime anymore. Uh, so we do want to make it about twice as big, but we want to take a prime number that's about twice as big because we do want to keep the table size prime because that has uh, some nice properties as we've seen. And you can actually just uh, keep a list, say, of 20 to 30 uh, prime numbers uh, in your code just because if you keep, uh, if you say double 30 times, you've made your table a billion times bigger. And so in most cases, that's kind of reasonable upper bound for how many times you might need to grow your hash table. All right, so now we have our uh, hash table data structure that provides these constant time uh, put get, remove, and contains operations. And we have uh, multiple strategies for dealing with the case when multiple uh, keys hash to the same index. And this, these hash table data structures are incredibly useful and we see them everywhere in computer science. And in particular, we'll see them uh, a lot in lab five, uh, where you'll be using them to generate text. All right, with that, uh, we're done with uh, this deep dive into hashing, and I look forward to your questions.